with over 50 hours now sunk into it, and with no signs of stopping yet, I still can't believe it's real. I really played and finished Kingdom Hearts 3. And to think, all I had to do was turn 31 in all that time. <laughs> So, full disclosure, I have played every Kingdom Hearts game out there multiple times, uh, except for maybe Union Cross, which I really have no intention of jumping into. I, I may read up on the little bits of lore that they keep adding, but uh, unless anyone can convince me, probably not. Anyway, I've basically, I've been a fan since the day that the original came out for the PS2. I have multiple copies of just about every game in the series, but practically every re-release that came out, and I've learned to love and accept this convoluted romp through Disney worlds and blades made of giant keys. My thoughts on this long-awaited entry in the series are going to be weird and disjointed, just like the game's plot, am I right? <laughs> so let's start with the good. One, it exists. <laughs> I liked it overall. It exists. <laughs> Although there were less actual stages this time around, uh, the size and the length of them more than made up for it. Uh, I will say I was mostly, mostly happy with the game's ending, minus a few specific things that I'll get into later. Um, but I did appreciate that they really tried to make uh, the stories from all of these previous games come together for the big finale. And I'll say they succeeded in a lot more ways than I was actually expecting them to, so... You know, positive vibes. It was also nice to see them make fun of their own silly plot points at times. I, I enjoy when people can make fun of themselves. I said that in my review of uh, the last Dragon Ball Super movie, and same here. I, I like when people can, can joke about themselves with themselves. I, I love that. Graphically, the game is excellent, with very nice animations to complement all the various Disney movies, and the main character's distinct looks and personalities from each Disney movie as well. Especially Pirates of the Caribbean. I mean, they, they really went all out in trying to get those likenesses. Uh, the environments also feature NPC characters talking all around you now in places like Twilight Town or Port Royal, and it makes everything seem a lot more lively than it ever did. And even though it, it may seem like a small touch, uh, I'm, I'm really glad to see it added. I, I think it added some personality. Did I mention it exists? As far as gameplay is concerned, this is by far the Osaka team's greatest output yet. No sign of Atlantica in sight. Well, except for Ariel being a summon, but I, I can I could live with that. I could I could deal with that. I'll take it. The gummy ship controls and combat were actually really nice, and maybe one of my favorite, if not my favorite, iteration of it so far. The stage for Pirates of the Caribbean was actually a lot of fun once you were able to take a ship and start exploring. The combat was kind of like a smoother, faster version of the ship combat from Assassin's Creed Black Flag, and I mean that in a good way. It, it was really fun. Probably the best stage. Goofy's dialogue is surprisingly on point the entire time. I mean, he was the first one to point out that Ventus was inside of Sora along with Roxas. It was Goofy. Not an Organization 13 member, not Sora, not Yen Sid. Goofy. <laughs> Though other people may have realized it too, and I just didn't catch that. It exists! Honestly, part of me was just surprised to get a game in the first place, let alone one that could actually make me say I came out overall satisfied. And let's be real here, the hype and the expectations were at the point where nothing could have actually lived up to them. And I, I promise I kept that in mind as I decided on what to praise and what to criticize here. And I will say my, my feelings of the series intact, uh, again, I still came out overall happy and satisfied with things. I still enjoyed my experience. And now we get to the bad. I think we'll find some ingredients around here. Uh, the game was too easy. Even on proud mode, it proved to be easier than Kingdom Hearts 2, which was already easier than the first Kingdom Hearts, and I don't think I even ran into any real difficulty during my Twitch stream of the game, except for maybe the last two or three final battles and the optional boss. Uh, hopefully we'll see an update with a critical mode and more content sometime in the future. And as I said before, though, this is the Osaka team's best output, 
to this point to me. But obviously, I would have much preferred a Tokyo team handling things as they did with the excellent Kingdom Hearts 2 final mix. Now, I know that wasn't possible since they no longer exist as is, but I don't know. It, it still hurts to think about what could have been in this instance. On that note, the Disney attraction attacks were so seriously overpowered. Not so much because of what they are or even how they work, per se, but there was absolutely no limit to how often you could really use it outside of having to attack an enemy when it had a green circle around it. But it appears so frequently that it's, it's almost like there was no limit to it. I started purposely not using them just to try to keep it somewhat challenging. If they were kept more infrequent and were only used in the more important scenes, like uh, say the way it was used in the fight with the Rock Titan in Olympus, uh, for example, then I would have found them far, far less annoying. Instead, I just found it to be a really weird design choice all around. Uh, you'll hear this from a lot of other people if you haven't already, but there's not really many Final Fantasy characters outside of the Moogles, uh, that Cactar sign, and then of course the entire Verum Rex project, since that was clearly made to reference Final Fantasy Versus 13, which was really unexpected. Uh, not a deal breaker for me, of course, but it was still really odd to just see everybody gone. No Cloud, no Squall, uh, I'm sorry, Leon, and uh, no, no Sephiroth, none of it. Did we really have to hear all of the Let It Go scene from Frozen? <laughs> also, is it me or did Sora, Goofy, and Donald have no real impact on that world whatsoever? <laughs> or Corona from Tangled, for that matter. Uh, I don't know, it, it's like the movies just played out around them while Sora, Goofy, and Donald stood by most of the time. <laughs> oh well. Getting Marshmello to join your party was badass at least, I will say that much. There was no climactic section in the middle of the game, as there was in 1 and 2, as well as many of the spin-offs, like Birth by Sleep. Nothing like that. No no major moment to make you go, wow, that was big, and, and keep going. It was just, it's just a rush to get to the ending. Speaking of rush, the game started to feel really rushed in places. The Hundred Acre Wood especially felt flat out tacked on, featuring a disappointing minigame that gets rehashed with a different coat of paint three different times. Uh, San Francisco from Big Hero 6 had potential to be one of the best worlds in the game, but instead ended up feeling like one of the worst due to the small map space, which Hero was all too happy to remind you about if you tried to get past it. I'm fairly certain that they used the daytime nighttime idea just so that they wouldn't have to make another map for it, so that they could put different things on the same map, um, but still keep it within that same space so that they didn't have to actually design a new one. I have a feeling all of this had to do with pressure to get the game out in time for release also, which is somewhat understandable, but it's still very noticeable. Come to think of it, Twilight Town was really shrunken down too. What was it, two screens? And I say understandable loosely because obviously we've been waiting a seriously long amount of time for this game to come out. So it just makes you wonder what really went on throughout that whole development cycle. I mean, we only know so much, I guess. The entire purpose of visiting these Disney worlds just seems more and more forced with every single entry in the series. This one, it boiled down to Sora, let the adults handle literally every other important task while you go screw around with Elsa and the gang for five hours. <laughs> I, I understand that this whole story has technically felt forced since back in the very first game, but it's just getting ridiculous now. Uh, ooh, figure out the power of waking that you had before but forgot it again. The, the game felt less like, wow, we need to visit these worlds in order to prepare for the final fight and more like, you must get through all these worlds in order to unlock the ending. Ha 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 It was hard not to feel like almost three quarters of the game was just straight up filler because of this, leading up to the main event at the end. I feel like I'd rather just play a Kingdom Hearts game without Disney worlds in it at this point. And way back when, I never thought I'd be saying that. I was really disappointed with the way that they handled both Aqua and Kairi's character development in this. Aqua especially deserved a better chance at redeeming herself. She goes on to say something like, you've seen me too weak for far too long, or something along those lines, only to fight Vanitas and then get beat up by him again and have to be saved by someone else again. <laughs> And don't even get me started on what they did with Kyrie, or should I say what they didn't 
do with Kyrie. Oh, mm. talk about a waste of potential. With that said, character development as a whole was not very good throughout this game. Did anyone really feel like Sora proved himself worthy of being a Keyblade Master by the end of this? Because I certainly didn't. I mean, it, it reminded me of Goku, but all the bad qualities of Goku. <laughs> The final fights themselves were really epic and awesome, as were the cutscenes following them for each uh, organization member and each other person that you were fighting, but I don't see why we couldn't actually play as some of the other characters from this fight more. We couldn't play as Aqua, Terra, Ventus, Roxas, Xion, Axel, Kairi, Riku, Mickey, or anyone else who was included in those battles. I don't know. It seemed a little cheap to have Sora jump in and help with all of them, especially when his involvement with a lot of these characters was already very minimal to begin with. They teased you being able to play as other characters earlier in the game when you tried a few fights with Riku and one with Aqua, but it all meant nothing in the end. Lastly, I was really burned out once I realized that the ending was, in fact, not really the end, but an implication that there's still more to come. After all the years that we waited for this to come out, we now have to accept that we're still not done. That we're probably going to have to wait more and more years to see another conclusion, or any kind of conclusion, for Sora. Sora, as of this moment, is likely dead, as a result of saving Kairi, and apparently is in the Shibuya district of Japan, and likely making some kind of connection with The World Ends With You, due to signs like the 104 over the building, uh, that's actually a 109 building in Japan itself. Um, th that was how people put together that it was connected with The World Ends With You, because only in that game does that building have a 104 over it, right? For those who don't know, the point of The World Ends With You is the main characters all starting out as dead people and being granted another chance at life through the uh, what's called the Reaper games that get thrown at them. So take what you will from that. If that's going to have a connection to the next game's story, hard to say. And then, of course, there's the main guy from Verum Rex, who was obviously made to look like Noctis from his Final Fantasy vs. XIII incarnation. Uh, it's... Again, it's very hard to say what's going to come of all of this. Who knows, may maybe the next one will be an all-Final Fantasy World Kingdom Hearts game. I'd, I'd, pr I'd probably still be interested in that. But as of right now, just... just burnout. It it's just burnout at this point. I'm... I'm still chucking through it. I'm still doing all the optional content. I beat the optional boss, the one optional boss. Ugh, one. And uh, I did most of the gummy ship missions, I'm trying to collect all the treasure chests, you know, trying to still get the platinum trophy, but burnout. I guess what I'm trying to say is I should hate it, but I don't because it's still Kingdom Hearts and I still love it, but it still deserves to be criticized because it was really disappointing in places, even though I still unconditionally love it. Damn you, Nomura! I guess I'm kind of numb from the whole thing. As I said before, it was hard to even believe I was really playing this, so it was even harder for me to try to form a rational opinion on it at first, which is why it took me this long to even put out a video about it. That, and working up the courage to talk about it, because let's face it, not everybody on YouTube is always very nice when it comes to talking about games like this. <laughs> In the end, I did still end up loving and enjoying my time with it, and I'm super glad that we finally reached this point. However, once the thrill of it all wore off, I started to really see all of the flaws become more and more apparent, and it did leave me feeling underwhelmed in a lot of ways. And that's a shame, you know, I don't want to feel this way, I just wanted to love this in the same way I loved 1, 2, Birth by Sleep, and many of the others. I suppose if I were giving this game a score based on everything I've said up to this point, it would have to be around a 7, and I, I think that that's fair, maybe even being kind in some places. Part of it's just love of the gameplay and the atmosphere. I mean, let's face it though, there's so much potential that I think we all feel it had that was just wasted and that we really started to lose by the end there. The only question now is going to be if we see some kind of downloadable content in the future and if we'll see a final mix at some point in the future to try to help things along more. But as it is, the ending just left me feeling drained. While they resolved a lot of conflicts really well, that one main little moment right before the credits just, just 
it, it almost took it all away <laughs> from me at this point, and that's a real shame. But hey, the soundtrack was awesome. I <laughs> I can't say anything bad about the soundtrack, right? Right. It's it's good. There's no debating. It's good. It's good. So yeah, seven. Seven's fair. Seven's fair. And I think that's going to wrap up all my main thoughts of it. I'm sure I'll think of more as time goes along. And maybe I'll talk about the ending more in another video if people really want me to. Um, but with that said, I, I think that sums up all of my main points uh, about the good and the bad with this long, long-awaited sequel for Kingdom Hearts. And that's going to do it for this video. Please remember to hit like and subscribe below if you enjoyed what you saw. Leave a comment, tell me what you thought about the game, because let's face it, you all you all have feelings about the game, just as I do. And I'd love to hear them all from you. Thanks again, and have a good night.